Have you ever asked yourself, how come certain people seem to be getting richer and yet you're getting broker? Have you asked yourself, how come certain people seem to be winning at everything that they do in their life and yet you are still the same old, same old? Well, I wanna share with you the law of sowing and reaping in this episode of the Seven Figure Squad Scripture Series starting in three, two, one, let's go. Never short stopping, now I'm winning like I'm Jida. Steady through the rigor, yeah, I'm getting bigger. Just fighting in them trenches, now I'm making seven figures like. What's cracking everybody? My name is Smart Guy, Matt Zappala here, hailing to you from Addison, Texas. And yes, we are officially in a studio. Now, I'm not so sure if we're gonna be here week in, week out, but man, how does it look? If you haven't done so already, please click that like button and hit the subscribe button because our goal is to get to 150,000 subs. So therefore we can award a church, charity, or nonprofit $5,000 from the squad to help out that organization on behalf of this YouTube community. All right, so let's get into it. Here are seven principles I wanna share with you from the law of sowing and reaping that's in the Bible to help you get to where you want to go financially, entrepreneurially, whether your def definition is wealth, success, happiness, and enjoyment, seven principles that can help you get to where you want to go. All right. So when I look at the Bible and it says, hey, Matt, a man reaps what he sows. This is in Galatians chapter six, verses seven. A man or woman reaps what they sow. What does that mean? So let's start with principle number one. Well, this law is in the Bible. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter one, verse 12. It reads like this. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds of trees, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And furthermore, as you read the scripture, it says that this seed and this fruit and this vegetation was given to man as food. So the law of reaping and sowing is what you are bearing, what you are growing, and what you are consuming has a lot to do with what your life is all about. It's in nature. Beginning of the year is about to start. Everybody's going to get on a health kick. And what the trainers will tell you is that, you sure, you might get strong in the gym, but what you put inside your body has a total outcome of what your body is about to look like. How you feel, how you think, your cognitive awareness, your mental clarity, how your joints feel, how your body feels, whether you're not flexible or whether you are flexible, it all has to do with what you consume. What are you sowing into your body and what you reap is what you put in. So in the natural world is the law of sowing and reaping. It's in nature. Let's take a look at the second principle here about what God has to say about receiving or halting your blessings. Now imagine sowing a seed into your enemy to forgive and love them. What? Yes, that's what Jesus was commanded here in Matthew chapter 5. Let's take a look at the context of this chapter. Let's start at verse 44. It reads like this. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. My question for you is, as you're looking at this thing, some of you guys have enemies out there, people that you don't like. Are you really praying for them? Even Jesus says, listen, man, you need to pray for people that you don't even like. Forgive and love your neighbor. To forgive and love them is like, your, imagine we had the world filled more like this. Are you praying for your enemies? Let's take a look at what Genesis chapter 26, verse 12 has to say about receiving or halting blessings. It reads like this. Isaac planted crops in that land and in the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed them. Now in the Bible, as you read the returns of blessings, 30, 60, 100 fold. 100 fold is like the bomb diggity, right? The 100 fold means like, yo, you were immensely blessed if you received a 100 fold blessing. In this case, Isaac received a 100 fold blessing. Why? Because God blessed them. Because God planted crops in the field. He planted, he sowed something and he got a return back. See, here's a problem today. People want to receive, but they don't want to plant. They don't want to do no work, but they want to win everything. You see, it doesn't work that way. The problem with America today, the way people think in this world today is that I don't have to do much, but I want to get everything. I want to get something for nothing. See, there's a big reason why I don't gamble. The big reason why I don't gamble is because it buys into that philosophy of doing something, very little, but getting so much in return. That's just not the way this works. There's a scripture in the Bible where God was warning the people of Israel, stop worshiping false idols. Stop worshiping the golden cow. Stop worshiping people. Stop worshiping things on this earth. God says, I want you to worship me. God wants you to honor him. 
And he warned them, if you continue worshiping things on this earth versus keeping your focus and sight set on God, I'm going to stop your blessing. You want to sow that? You're going to receive this. Let's read what was said here in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 16. It reads like this. Then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. So again, another reference of sowing and reaping. If you're not listening, you're not paying attention, you're not honoring God's word. God says, no problem. I got you. <laughs> Law of free will is kicking in. You want to sow a seed of, I got this, God. I'm on my own. Awesome. Well, your enemy is going to enjoy my blessings. Not you. you enjoy my blessings. So do your thing. But then again, there's also consequences. Where there's an action, there's always a reaction. And again, back to the natural world of principle number one. Now, the third principle is referencing the spiritual. So there's a natural world. In, in, in principle number one, the spiritual word in number three. Let's take a look at what Galatians 6, 7 has to say. A man reaps what he sows. Bottom line, God cannot be mocked. There are consequences to your actions. Matter of fact, there's consequences also to your inaction. This world, this spiritual world, this natural world operates on cause and effect. There are consequences to everything. So as you're going through this principle, ask yourself, what type of consequences do I want in my life? What type of consequences do I want in my finances? What type of consequences do I want to have in my business? What type of consequences do I want in my family? Again, bottom line, the choice is yours. God does not force anything upon you. However, whatever you reap is because of what you've sown in the past. Let's go to principle number four. Number four implies that as you are sowing and reaping, just think about this. When you plant a seed, do you expect immediate harvest? How many people have the intention of having automatic success? The challenge that a lot of people see today, for example, cryptocurrencies. Oh my gosh, in a year I made a 60,000% return. NFTs, oh my gosh, I sold this NFT, I minted this thing. Next thing you know, uh, this guy named Logan Paul is selling it for $600,000. People see that, okay? But what they don't see is all the losses in the past. What they don't see is the difficulty. What they don't see that this is just not easy money. Many of the people I've seen make a lot of money. Along the way, they've also lost a lot of money too as well. So let's take a look at the patience necessary to grow a business, the patience necessary to see an actual investment come to fruition. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, it reads like this. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters has one purpose, and they will be rewarded according to their labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. You know, the whole bottom line about this whole financial, biblical, faith-based millionaire thing is that ultimately it's God's money. Ultimately, it's God's business. Ultimately, it's God's world. You're just a steward of it. In other words, God has entrusted you with finances. God has entrusted you with opportunity. God has entrusted you with a business, with a family. God has entrusted you with a body, with your health. Question for you is, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to magnify what God and multiply what God has given to you? Let's take another look at a couple other scriptures. Here in Matthew chapter 9, verses 38 how God continues to imply patience through this principle. It reads like this. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Who is the Lord of the harvest? It's God. But you got to send out work. In other words, in the meantime, as you're waiting for your harvest to finally manifest, as you're waiting for your crop to finally grow, so therefore you can reap the benefits of that harvest, you have to send out workers. Workers, you got to work. You want to be able to say, hey, Lord, while you're sending your blessing on its way, I'm going to be faithful in my labor. I'm going to get to work. See, oftentimes people want to do the least but get the most. I get it. You know, I'm in the sales industry. I'm in the sales business. I'm in the insurance industry. Lots of times agents in our industry, they want to sell less but make more commissions. Right. I totally get where they're coming from. I totally understand it because it's hard to work. 
Labor is not fun. Work's not fun. But guess what God encourages us to do? Work. Because in the faithfulness of our labor, in the faithfulness of our, and I, by the way, I'm not just not saying you should work to just work. The labor is just the labor. Smart work, working hard at the right things, making sure that your time is productive. You're just not busy being busy. And at the same time, God implores us here in Galatians 6 verse 9, what we should do, our attitude. Let's take a look at what the scripture says. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So what happens if you give up? Oftentimes I see that's what happens. Somebody is about to win. They're right at the edge of the finish line, but they can't see the finish line. Why? Because it's God's finish line. And they quit at the wrong time. Or they give up at the wrong time. They, they stop saying, I believe in my vision. I stop believing in the vision and the dream that God's given me. They stop believing it. And they ping pong throughout life. You know, there's a book right now there called Outwitting the Devil. Pretty interesting book. And one of the principles and one of the stories he creates, or one of the titles he calls people is called being a drifter. People drift from here, people drift from there. It gets hard over here, they drift back here. They get their uh, 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 feelings hurt. They get their attitude put in check. They get their ego busted. They drift, they drift, they drift. But what scripture says, scripture says here, do not become weary in doing good, assuming that you're doing good. Now, if you're doing bad, get weary. If you're doing bad, yeah, you should get up here pretty soon. That's why there's no such things as friends being criminals. So when you say, hey, I'm not here to do good. I'm going to do some good things. At the proper time, we will reap a harvest if you don't, what? Give up. Let's take a look at the next principle. We've been talking about this from the beginning. You reap what you sow. Let's take a look at from a proper perspective. What King Solomon, one of the wisest and richest kings who ever lived, he led the people of Israel, I believe for over 40 years, through a golden age of prosperity, wealth, happiness, enjoyment. I mean, bottom line, wouldn't you love our country, the country that you live in, to go through a period of wealth, happiness, and prosperity? Let's take a look at what Proverbs, what he wrote in Proverbs. Here, chapter 11, verse 18, and also go to Proverbs chapter 22 as well. A wicked person earns deceptive wages, but the one who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. Again, back to the law of sowing and reaping. Again, if you sow righteousness, you reap reward. If you sow laziness and deceptive practices, guess what you're going to have? You're going to reap something else too as well. There's always a consequence to whatever it is that you sow. There's always a consequence to action or inaction. There's always a consequence to having patience or having no patience. That's why I'm always saying faith-based millionaires don't believe in getting rich quick overnight. Now, that being said, if you believe that getting rich quick overnight was 10 years, I get it. Because lots of times, a lot of people don't see the 10 years. They don't see the 20 years. They just see the final product. Well, let others see the final product in you. In the meantime, guess what you do? You go out there and you be righteous in your effort. You be righteous in your labor. You sow good, you get great. You sow bad, you get worse. Which leads me into my next principle, based on what I just said there. The law of sowing and reaping will also bring out a multiplier effect. What? A multiplier effect. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 8. It reads like this. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, 160 or 30 times what was sown. Again, this goes back to the principle of the law of the sower, which I recommended in another video I did. And the sower was going across a footpath, he was going across rocky ground, he was going across thorny ground, and he finally came across the good soil. And the challenge that you have as a sower is you go out there and you put seed in something that can multiply. Sometimes you're sitting there in business. Sometimes you're trying to chase good money after bad. And when you put yourself in that position of saying, okay, this thing isn't working, this person doesn't want to help themselves. One of the most frustrating things in business or helping people with their finances is this. Helping people that don't want to help themselves. No matter how much great example or investment that you've made into them, if they're not willing to help themselves, there's practically nothing you can do outside of a miracle. Miracles don't come from you anyway. There's nothing you can practically do to raise them up to improve their level of condition. 
There's nothing you can do. Sure, they're received. Sure, they'll get the reaping, but they don't want to do any of the sowing. They don't want to want to do the work. They don't want to go out in the field. They don't want to have patience in their life. They want it now, today, yesterday. What you put out, you get back not just equal. It comes back in a multiplier type of effect. It's not an addition business. God's not in an addition business. God's not in the division business. God is in the multiplier business. And that principle happens, again, good or bad, and it's your choice of what you want to do with that seed. Let's take a look at what is written in Hosea chapter 8, verse 7. It reads like this. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no head. It would produce no flower. Were it to yield grain, foreigners would swallow it up. Again, it's a multiplier. You sow the wind, you get back the whirlwind. You sow a seed of goodness and righteousness. Guess what will come back your way? Here's the thing about sowing. Sometimes you sow a seed, but you don't expect anything back in return. You don't want to sow a seed for selfish reasons. Well, I gave a dollar, I expect a hundredfold back. No, back to the implication of patience. That whatever God gives you, He gives you. You'd be thankful for it, you're grateful for it, and you say, okay, how can I multiply this some more? How can I increase my ability with the seed I re received in return to make sure that the next time I sow this seed, I get a 30-fold back or a 60-fold back or a 100-fold back? How can I improve my ability? By the way, I want you to watch this video right here. It's the Bible story that made me millions. It's called the Parable of the Talents because the master was leaving for a journey, and he gave his three servants money, talents, weight of silver according to their Ability. I want you to make sure that you're the type of person that when you receive a seed, that God isn't ready for you yet to handle $10,000. You got to understand it. Or God isn't ready for you yet to handle $100,000. You got to be ready for that. But mentally speaking, spiritually speaking, emotionally speaking, financially speaking, you got to be able to one day receive the opportunity. Say, God says, okay, he's sending a blessing. Awesome, Lord. Now I can move because I've been prepared for this. Because you don't labor thinking, oh, I'm going to get ready when it's time to get ready. No, you get to get ready before it's time to get ready. Now let's take a look at the seventh principle here. That in the law of sowing and reaping, there's an opportunity here of death, of rebirth, and recreation. How would you like to recreate your finances? How would you like to recreate your business? How would you like to recreate yourself? Let's take a look at what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It reads like this. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. So there's an opportunity for you to say, you know what, whatever has been, bury it and allow God to manifest a new creation in you. One of the things I had to do when I filed bankruptcy, one of the things I had to do when I went through a divorce is forgive myself. I needed to bury it. That needed to be put to death. The bad mistakes I made with money, the bad mistakes I made with relationships, the bad mistakes I made with business operations, the bad mistakes I made with just overall dealing because I'm just trying to figure this thing out. But if you sow it and say, hey, God, let me let you take over. Let me follow your principles. Let me follow your values that you put inside Scripture. Just like it says here in John chapter 12, it reads like this. Very true, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So when you're looking at who you are, what you represent in your life, your finances, the rebirth, the recreation phase. Just because, just because something dies doesn't mean it doesn't rebirth and have another life. There's many times I failed in my investments. There's many times I failed in my business dealings. But that allowed me the experience and the wisdom and the know-how not to do that ever again. So I could have another life. So if I'm going to restart again, if I'm going to be rebirth, if I'm going to recreate myself, I realize that sowing that bad seed, just because that opportunity died, just because that investment died doesn't mean I don't have a chance to learn from that experience and rebirth it and to make sure that I avoid the pitfalls for the rest of my career, for the rest of my investments, for the rest of my life. And that is all part of the process of the law of sowing and reaping. So some of the questions you ask yourself as I wrap stuff up. 
should ask yourself, should I really prosper? Matt, should I prosper as a human being? And by the way, prosperity has a lot to do more with just money. Prosperity has a lot to do more than just material wealth. I was breaking down the etymology of the word prosper. And in the Latin version, because I understand, the reason why I break these down is and understand certain words, because I know that things are lost in translation. If the Bible has been translated many, many times, and the original context of the text was Greek and Hebrew, and people of, of Latin descent also understanding this too as well. What is the word of prosper? In Latin, it means to do well. In Hebrew, the word prosper means salak. It means to push forward, to break out. Can you push forward with your finances? Can you break out with your opportunities? Can you break out with your career? Are you prospering? So no, this word prosper is just not a noun. It's a verb. In Greek, in vimiro, that's the word for prosper. It means to thrive, to do well. Do you want your finances to thrive? Or do you want your finances to dive? Ask yourself this question. What do you, not only what do you want, ask yourself what does God want? Let's look at, at 1 Corinthians here, what, uh, what God has to say in this chapter. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up, so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. So what it is implying is, if you want prosperity in your life, and you know money comes from God, you should set aside money. People call that tithing. People that's setting aside money for God's work. Whatever that is. You have to make sure if your money is coming from God, if you're a steward of this money, set aside money, give money, charity, donations, whatever the case may be, with the expectation you get nothing from that back. That's the whole process of sowing and reaping. Because here's the thing too as well, back to the multipliers. You never know how much what you sow multiplies in return. You never know how much that will come back to you 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. When you sow into God's people, when you just sow into God's creation, what will happen to you? You will eventually prosper. Now, once you are prospering, what should you do with that prosperity? Let's take a look at what it says here in Proverbs chapter 3. It reads like this. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Again, invoking one of my favorite principles, which is the principle of multipliers. God will multiply if you take care of his people because you're sowing a seed of righteousness. So a few things here on your to-do list. If you want to go from poor to rich, should you go from poor to rich? Should you feel guilty about going from poor to rich? Let's read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. It reads like this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich... Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So think about this real quick. God became poor so he can give you everything. How would you feel if you said, you know what, I'm going to sacrifice for you kids. I'm going to sacrifice your kids so therefore you can go to college. So I can pay for your college tuition. I'm going to sacrifice for your kids so therefore you can have better opportunities than I had when I was growing up. And your kids did nothing with it. How would you feel about that? Hmm? Now, God's got that same relationship with you. He became poor, so therefore you can become rich. You can prosper. You can move forward. You can push forward. You can break out for him. You do nothing great by being broke. Now, your second thing on to-do list here. The Bible always talks about being strong and courageous. Do not fear, right? Okay, let's talk about being strong and courageous in your finances. Being strong and courageous, becoming a first-generation millionaire. It says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7 through 8, it reads like this. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. See, again, there's words there that God not only wants you to be strong and courageous, but he wants you to be prosperous and successful. Well, Matt, I have a different definition of success. I have a different definition of prosperity. Well, great. Is it moving you forward? Is it allowing you to break out? Is it giving you an excuse to hide behind God? Say, hey, in my humility, I don't want to express. No, God wants you to express and multiply the seed he gave you. He wants to express 
his will and his purpose to you and through you. So just don't be strong and courageous. Be prosperous and successful. The third point is this. You know, one of the enemies of success is success. And if you don't want that to be an enemy, take a look at what 2 Chronicles says here about avoiding that enemy as it relates to your finances, as it relates to your prosperity. It reads like this. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. So when you're looking at your finances, when you're looking at prosperity, when you're looking at wealth and happiness and generosity, are you constantly seeking God? Are you constantly seeking Him in all that you do? Okay, you got this to this level, are you still seeking Him? Okay, you got to this level, are you seeking Him? Okay, you're debt free, are you still seeking Him? Because if you are still seeking Him, guess what? He will continue to do. He will continue throwing the seeds of success and the reaping of prosperity your way if you keep seeking Him. So for everybody out there watching this video, and if you think you should feel guilty about wealth, happiness, prosperity, that's what you're sowing out into the world, guilt. Guess what you're going to get back? You're going to get even more guilt. But you say, you know what? The opposite is true. Let me find out the success principles. Does God want prosperity in my life? Does He want wealth in my life? Deuteronomy 8.18, God has given you the power to create wealth. It is He, the Lord your God, who has given you the power to create wealth. But you got to do something with that power. you got to sow the seed of power. If you don't sow the seed of power, guess what you get back in return? You get weakness. So my friends, keep seeking. So I'd love to know your thoughts, your comments, your questions. Put it in the comment section below. Your feedback, I love it. I welcome it. And uh, for all the uh, people out there that uh, doesn't think that God wants you to be wealthy, that God doesn't want you prosperous, consider this law of sowing and reaping. Again, a couple of videos I want you to check out before I let you go. Number one, here is the Bible story that made me millions. And also the video here about the parable of the star. Please check out these two videos right here. That being said, guys, if you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our business page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click like, click subscribe, and hit notifications to be alerted the next time we upload our next episode. That being said, guys, from Dallas, Texas, I'm your Money Smart Guy. And until we meet again, continue smart, continue smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys.